John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 1. We're talking about the deity of Christ in the book of John. And that's our emphasis. It's not just telling the stories and all, but it's emphasizing the deity of Christ. Actually, that's what the book is about. So when you read the book of John, always be looking for the deity of Christ, which means Jesus is God. And I know all of us probably believe that. I think maybe the people that are watching by video, they, most of them probably believe it too. Maybe not. And, uh, but we need to know that Jesus is God. If he's not, we're in a lot of trouble, you know. And so we're just going to go through a few verses here and uh, select verses and talk about each one of them. Starting at verse 1, we'll read three verses and go from there. Verse 1 says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this great book that talks about your deity. Thank you, Lord, for those who were able to come this morning, who actually got out and came to church to, to be with us and to worship you and to give you honor and glory for who you are, what you've done for us, and be thankful uh, for all of those things that uh, we uh, receive from you. Thank you for our church, Lord. And there, there's an, uh, an overwhelming uh, depression, I think, in most of the churches today because of all that's going on. Help us, Lord, not to be fearful of those things, but to be faithful, to be in church and to worship you. Uh, forgive us of the times that we neglect that and ask that you'll be with us now as we talk about this important subject. In Jesus' name, amen. So in these three verses, we find out that Jesus leaves Judea. He leaves Judea. It was always God's plan that Jesus would outshine John the Baptist. You know that. Uh, and that's why that John said in chapter 3, verse 30, he said, He must increase, I must decrease. Now, you know that verse. You've heard that most all your life. I must decrease and he must increase. And yet it was not time yet for John to decrease. Because John was doing a great work, and he was preaching the gospel, and people were being saved, and he was baptizing uh, a lot of people. And uh, so it wasn't really time for Jesus to sort of outshine John. And so he decided that when uh, he heard that people were saying that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, he decided uh, to leave Judea and go into Galilee. Now, Galilee was his home place. Uh, as you know, Nazareth was in Galilee, and that's where, uh, where uh, Jesus lived. Uh, but then I want you to notice something uh, sort of off that subject in a way, but it's important, I think. Notice uh, in verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that, and here's what I want you to see, heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Notice those words, he made and baptized more disciples than John. You see, you make disciples before you baptize them. Amen? That's important to know. You make them first. The Great Commission says, Go ye into all the world and preach, or teach all nations. The word teach there means to make disciples. And then baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and so on. And so we make disciples first, and then we baptize them. You don't baptize anybody until they're already a disciple. So many people today... Uh, not just the, uh, what we used to call the Camelite movement, not just those people, but even other people believe that baptism has a whole lot to do with salvation. But baptism has nothing at all to do with salvation except in a symbol that it is what we picture in baptism that saves us, and that is the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's very important. So now Jesus is leaving uh, Judea and going to Galilee. Now look at verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. That's interesting, isn't it? That uh, it's right where Jacob gave his son Joseph uh, a well, a parcel of ground that had a well on it that we, that we find out in this story. So in order to go to Galilee, Jesus had to either go around Samaria, which was a long trip, 
or he must needs go through Samaria because Samaria was sort of the open gate, the open door to Galilee. But there was a problem, you see. First of all, Samaria was a capital of the northern kingdom, Israel. Uh, it was a place uh, into which the Assyrians placed foreigners. They put foreigners in this little place of Samaria. And then those foreigners married with the Israelites and mixed their blood. And so they became what today a lot of people would call half-breed people. Or they were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. And as a result of that, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Because a Jew was a Jew, a Gentile was a Gentile. There was no such thing as a mixture of the two. <laughs> and so they didn't have any dealings with them. The Samaritans actually thought that they were descendants of Joseph and uh, that it was because of Joseph and that well there that was dug there, probably Jacob's people dug the well, and because of that, that they, they descended from Joseph and they had right to all of that area and all of that and that what they were doing was proper to be done. Um, so it was a determined decision. Jesus determined that he was going to go through Samaria. Now, he did not have to go through Samaria. It sounds like that when it says he must needs go through Samaria. He didn't have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria because that was his determined decision to go through Samaria because it was God's will that he go through Samaria. And you know, the Bible says that it is written in the book, I came to do thy will, O Lord. And so God determined that he was going to go through Samaria, so Jesus had to go through Samaria. And whatever God determined, that's what Jesus had to do. And whatever God determined, that's exactly what Jesus did. He's God. He's perfectly God. Um, now, Samaria was an area. Uh, and in that area, there was a city called Sychar, and that's where he went uh, there, uh, according to verse number 4. Um, now, look down, look in verse number uh, 6 through 8. Jesus asked for a drink. Verse 6 says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, that's the humanity of Christ. He was human. He got tired. He got thirsty. And so uh, he was there at uh, Jacob's well, and he actually got thirsty. And it says, uh, he set... Uh, being wearied in his journey, he sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which was about noontime. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat or food, to buy food. So Jesus went to Jacob's well, which was the place there that, uh, that he wanted to be. He knew where he was going. He stopped there because he knew uh, that that woman was coming to the well. That means he's God. He's weary, he's thirsty, he's human. But he's stopped there and sat on the well because not only did he want a drink, I don't know whether he ever got a drink. I don't think the Bible ever said he actually got a drink. Maybe he did, I don't know. But he knew that woman was coming and his purpose was not just to get a drink of water, but it was something a little bit deeper than that, of course, you see. Um, in knowing these two things, we find the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the woman came to draw water, Jesus said, give me to drink. Now that sounds like a, a command. Okay, woman, give me a drink. But actually it was a request. I don't know whether you know grammar well enough or not, but you know if you, uh, if you are writing something, a letter or whatever, and you ask somebody, uh, will you do something for me? A period goes at the end of that, not a question mark. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that weird? Will you please send me two copies of your latest book? Period. And you know why? Because it's a request. It's not a question. You don't want the person to answer the question. You want them to send you the books. And so, it's, and so this sounds like a command, but it's not. It's a request. This is a request. Give me a drink. Or we would say, may I have a drink of water? And he didn't mean any disrespect. It was just that he started a conversation by, uh, by a human need that he had. He was thirsty, and he wanted a drink of water. So here we see the humanity of Christ, and we see his deity also. Now verse 9. 
the woman wonders about the request. Verse 9 says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest to drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and I would have given thee living water. Now he's right into the, uh, into the meat of the conversation. And he's talking to her about not only physical and fleshly things, but he's talking to her about spiritual things, which she has no idea about. She doesn't understand spiritual things. So the woman is wondering why Jesus, a Jew <coughs> who's coming up from Judea, why he would ask her, a Samaritan, for a drink of water, since the Jews have no dealings uh, with the Samaritans. But we find out, as we read the Bible, that Jesus had dealings with everybody, didn't he? <laughs> he dealt with everybody. I have a couple of verses, if you'd like to turn. 1 John 2.2 2, uh, deals with the idea that Jesus didn't come to save just the Jews. And it says there, you may be familiar with it, it says in 1 John 2, 2, it says, And he is the propitiation, satisfaction, for our sins and not for ours only, the Jews, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is the satisfaction for the, for the sins, not just of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles, and even the Samaritans, which are a mixed, a mixed breed, or whatever it is, whatever nationality or kind of a person uh, you are. And also, we know John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and that means the whole world. Actually, uh, in essence, it means a Gentile, because the Lord was in the minds of the disciples. He's trying to teach them that we're going to begin preaching to the Gentiles, and they're actually going to believe and trust the Lord, where the Jews many times will not. And it's going to work that way. So he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so now Jesus is dealing not just with the Jews, but he's dealing with mixed breed people. This should have told the disciples a whole lot of things that they needed to know. Jesus' answer then in verse 10 is straightforward. He answered to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now I've asked you for a drink of water. And again, I don't know whether he got a drink of water or not. She may have been taken back by the idea that he's talking about something that she knows nothing about. If you knew the gift of God. Well, what is the gift of God? If you knew the gift of God. Well, we find that in the Bible. Ephesians 2.8. Most of you can quote this. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So if you knew the gift of God, you would ask me for a drink. But evidently she didn't know anything about the gift of God. So many people don't know about the gift of God. They don't know about salvation. And, mo and a lot of times it's because we don't tell them about it. It's because we don't go to them and talk to them and tell them about the Lord. I do my best to talk to everybody wherever I go and try to tell them about the Lord. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. And sometimes they look at you cross-eyed. But that's okay, you know, that's, just, that's, that's my job. So I try to do it everywhere I go. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew anything about eternal life, you would be asking me for a drink. But she didn't know anything about that. The second thing he said to her, if you knew who it is who's speaking to you, Jesus himself is the gift of God. Yeah, there, I had John to put out there on the, uh, on the sign, God's unspeakable gift. That's Christ. God's unspeakable gift. 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's unspeakable. You can't describe the Lord, not really the way you want to. You can't tell who he is. You can't explain to people really who Jesus is because he's more than our language can express. We know him in our heart and our spirit and our soul and so forth, but we can't describe him because he's more 
than what we can comprehend. Now, in John 4 there in the text, down in verse 25, it says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. Now, at least she knew that. She got some theology from some Jew somewhere. It says, when he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith to her, I that speak unto thee am he. You know, he tried to tell that to the Jews. They wouldn't believe him. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am the King of the Jews. You know, and, and they didn't hear it. Now he's telling her, I that speak unto thee am he. So he admits he is the Messiah. And so the woman could have asked for living water. If she had known what the gift was, and if she had known that he was the Messiah, she could have asked, give me living water. It's not in this well, but you have to give it to me. So give me living water. If she had known the gift of God, and she didn't really know the gift of God. And uh, John 4, look at verse 13 real quick. It tells us what the living water is. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. The water in this well. See, Jacob's pretty well known. Jacob is part of that great covenant that God made with Israel. And with the Gentiles also, by the way. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, they are the fathers of the covenant. And Jacob was the one who dug that well. See? But he says, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Boy, that's some pretty good water, isn't it? That's some awful, awful nice water. If you can just take a drink and you don't ever thirst again, that'd be pretty nice. Now she's still talking, she's still thinking about the water in Jacob's well. Or maybe another well where they could go and Jesus could give her a drink out of that well and maybe she would never come back to the well to draw water again. But she still doesn't quite get it. But she's going to, I think. Look at verse 11. Jesus is greater than Jacob. Because see, in Samaria, Jacob was the big deal. Joseph and Jacob, they were the big deal, you know. Because Jacob dug the well. Now, he didn't literally do it himself, I don't think, but he, he had it, he had it uh, dug. Uh, look at verse 11. The woman saith to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Are you greater than Jacob? My, what a question. <laughs> what a question to ask the Messiah. He just told her, I'm the Messiah, and the Messiah will tell us all things. And she said, are you greater than our father Jacob? Well, you have nothing to draw with. I don't see anything here for you to draw from any well, including this well. How are you going to get water? And so she surmises that Jesus has to get this living water from somewhere besides this well. So she's coming closer and closer. You know, the Lord revealing to her spiritual things. Now she's coming closer and closer to the idea that he's talking about some water that's not any in any well like this well of Jacob. And so she said, well, then where are you going to get this water? In other words, you're not going to get it here. Because you said if we drink of this water, I'm going to thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I'll give you, you won't thirst again. Where are you going to get this water? It's not in Jacob's well, that's for sure. So she wonders from a spiritual aspect whether Jesus might be greater than Jacob who gave them this well here at um, Sychar. Instead of answering her question directly, Jesus explains the water which uh, he can give to her there in uh, verse 13 and 14 we've already read and what that will do if you'll never thirst again. Any water that we drink here on earth, of course, will last a while. I was watching uh, yesterday afternoon, I was watching the rifleman 
Of course, you don't know anything about that. You're not old enough to know what the rifleman is. Uh, but uh, I was watching the rifleman, and he and the little boy were out in the desert, and I don't, I don't remember. I didn't see the first part. I don't know how they got there, but, but they were about... They were going to go on this long journey, walk or something. And so they were trying to get enough water that they could uh, be, you know, have enough water to last all that big walk they were going to, because uh, they had only one horse and a whole bunch of problems, you know. And so um, Mark, the little boy, he began to drink water and drink water and drink water. And he said, now you drink all the water you can until it just about makes you sick. So he was drinking out of the coffee pot, you know, drinking water, drinking water. And then, his, and then his dad got the coffee pot and put water on it and poured it over his head. And he said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, I want you to be drenched with water. Because it's got to last a long time. And so he poured water all over him, you know. And uh, now you know, humanly speaking, that water's not going to last. And so that was part of the story, nat naturally. Now, I'm not going to tell you how it ended because I don't even remember. So it doesn't make any difference. But nonetheless, water, water is important. You know, we, we need to drink. I found out. A few months ago, I wasn't drinking enough water, and I was being—I was getting dehydrated. And I just recently found I wasn't eating enough, so I started eating a little bit more. If you notice, I'm getting fat. It's because I'm eating a little bit more. And the thing of it is, it has helped my pain. It's helped me feel better. And so I don't know. I'm going to talk to the doctor about you know how much am I supposed to eat? Because if it makes me feel better, I'll just eat more and more and more. And so we need water. It's, it's a necessity. But he said, if you drink this water, you will thirst again. Uh, but the water that Jesus is going to give her will be springing up into everlasting life. You take one drink of the water that I'll give you, and it'll be like a spring. Now, when I was a little boy, I didn't know the difference between a well and a cistern. I had no idea. I thought a well was a well, a cistern was a well, a well was a cistern. It's just a big hole in the ground you get water out of. That's all I knew. Until I went uh, down in southern Kentucky and I found out that, uh, that down there they dig wells. Up here in northern Kentucky, most people don't have wells. Some do, but not very many. And uh, so down there, they, they dig wells. Down in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, where my wife was raised, uh, they had a deep, it was 80 feet deep before you could get to the water. You had to go down 80 feet to get to the water. But that water just kept, there was a spring under there, and it just kept going through and going through, and they never ran out of water, never ran out of water, because the water was constantly coming through. And you know that's what salvation is. It's a spring of living water, as the song says, a spring of living water. And, and it's welling up in us like a spring uh, to everlasting life. And that everlasting life, it, it keeps bubbling up and keeps bubbling up and keeps, and it never goes away. And you never thirst again. That's eternal security and why people don't believe it. I have no idea. But it's bubbling up to everlasting life. That's what salvation does. That's what this water is. Now John 6.35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Boy, that would be nice. Except the fact that I didn't hunger, I'd die. You know, and uh, but he said, you come to me, you won't ever hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You will never want for salvation again because you'll always have it. It'll always be there. Now then, real quick, verse 15. The woman passes the test. Verse 15 says, the woman saith unto him, sir... Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She still doesn't quite get it, does she? <laughs> not quite. She's coming to it. Jesus answered unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast, and now hast is not thy husband, in that sayest thou truly. The woman saith to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Uh-oh, something's happened to this woman. She's perceiving. She's understanding. She's coming to an understanding of, of spiritual things. I perceive, sir, that you are a prophet. Well, he said, he's already said, I am the Messiah. <laughs> she didn't get it. He said, I, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So the woman's request was correct, but her mind was still... Still sort of on the carnal side. She said, sir, give me this water. She didn't want to come back and, and have to uh, 
go to the well to bring up water again. Now the Bible says in Romans 8, 7, because a carnal mind's enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So something had to happen to that woman before she could understand anything spiritually. And so then Jesus gives her a challenge. And he said, now I want you to go home and get your husband and bring him here. She said, I don't have a husband. She said, you're right, you don't have a husband. Now, just to stop there for a minute, I got into a discussion not long ago with someone about if you live with someone, like a man and a woman, if you live together, you can be married without going through uh, the legal channels. I said, well, how can that be? Well, you know, they call it common law marriage. I said, yeah, they call it that. But I said, you're not husband and wife. Because, you see, marriage is a legal thing. Um, it's actually more a legal thing than it is a religious thing. I don't know of any church in the Bible anywhere that had a wedding that married anybody. Churches don't marry people. The people that, have, that I bring together legally, that's me. That's not this church. The church marries nobody. I marry people, but the church doesn't marry people. And it's weird, you know, because... Everybody wants to be married in the church. I don't know why they want to be married in the church. But it's okay. I like it. I like that, in fact. I like the connection between marriage and the church. Nothing wrong with that. But churches don't marry people. People marry people, see? And I've done a lot of them. I wish I'd kept a record of all of them, but I haven't. And so uh, she was living with this man. And what did Jesus say about that? He said, he is not your husband. Oh, but they were living together, common law, don't you know? They're married, yeah. No, 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 no. No, he is not your husband. You have had five husbands. Now, how did she know the difference between having a husband and not having a husband? Did he just move out and say, well, he's not my husband anymore because he moved out. And then another one moved in, well, he's my husband because he... No, Jesus said, you have no husband. You're right. And she admitted, I don't have a husband. Now, that's sort of off the subject. But I think it's brought out here pretty well. And he said, now, the, the important part here is that Jesus actually told her what her life was about. Your life is about getting married and not getting married and getting married and not getting married and living this way and that way. Uh, that's your problem. And then, did you ever talk to somebody and then right in the middle of it they changed, they changed the subject? Well, here's what's going to happen. Look at verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is come. Uh, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So she changes the subject. She said, now, now let's talk about let's, where, where are we supposed to worship. Well, he wasn't talking about that. He's talking about her husband. <laughs> so where should we worship? Should we worship up here in Mount Gerizim? Mount Gerizim was given to us by Joseph and Jacob and all of that, and we've built a, a nice temple up there, and, and uh, we have pagan practices there, and partly Jewish practices, partly pagan practices, and all of that, and, and that's where we worship. Now, you say you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Now, which one is right? Boy, that'll get your mind all messed up. On <laughs> and Jesus said, well, neither one. It's not a matter of where you worship. He said... True worship doesn't come from a building or a mountain. True worship comes from the heart. And he said, you need to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. A thing that she knew very little about. All she knew about was mountains and water in the well and husbands. <laughs> That's all she knew about. She didn't know anything about this other worship. But notice, Jesus answered her and said, "Ye worship, you know not what. You don't know what you're worshiping. We know what we worship. 
for salvation is of the Jews. Now he is being real pointed to her now. And he's telling her, now listen, you can worship in Mount Gerizim or you can worship in Jerusalem and it doesn't matter. You can be wrong or you can be right. It don't matter. Because in Mount Gerizim, that's not uh, where we worship because salvation is of the Jews. The prophecies of the Old Testament say that Jesus would be a Jew. And he was a Jew. Don't tell me that Jesus was black or Jesus was Chinese or Jesus was everything. No, he was a Jew. Salvation is of the Jews. Our salvation came from the Jews. We have a whole lot that we owe to the Jews. And mainly because God set it up that way. He sent his Messiah as a Jew. He was a full-blooded Jew that came down from Abraham all the way down through those hundreds of years, and he was the son of Mary without an earthly father. Now let's be a better close this pretty soon. Um, Romans 6, 17 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. So we worship the Lord uh, in the spirit and in the heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so now, he talked to her about her husbands. He talked to her about Mount Gerizim and, and about Jerusalem. And uh, got all that all taken care of. And then... She goes home and tells all the men about a man that told her everything she ever did. So we, we don't know what else he talked about. But he must have talked to her a long time about everything she ever did. And the men said, oh, yeah, well, okay, that's what you say. And then they went out and they, they believed the Lord because they heard him say those things instead of her. And so what the Lord did here the Lord went to a lost lady that was of a Gentile nature, gave the gospel to her, and she believed in Jesus Christ as her Messiah and as her Savior. And the world needs to do that today. Jesus was a Jew, yes. If you're uh, anti-Semitic, it's going to be hard for you to trust the Lord because salvation is of the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And Jesus came, died, went to the grave, paid for our sins, resurrected the third day. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life and will never hunger and will never thirst again. Let's stand together. Pray.